Uh, my most recent reason for finding it more difficult sometimes is uh, this little beauty. Here's an excuse to just put up a graphic of my new dog. This is Maisie. She's 12 and a half weeks old, and she's a Jack Russell pup. And this is uh, Senan Beach. Okay, still got a little bit of internet problems, but hopefully we're uh, catching up. <clears throat> so Maisie the dog joined us about four weeks ago. And uh, amazing how many more expenses come up when you've got a beast in the house. Um, just uh, frightening. All sorts of things that I never you know, thought of. You know, the first trip to the vet was 60 quid. Um, the second one was 20 odd quid. I've already signed up a monthly payment plan with the vet. Um, but you know what? The dog is great fun, of course. But uh, one of the biggest reasons for finding it difficult sometimes to spend less than we earn is the two little figures above the dog's head there, which are my daughter's. Uh, and that's Senan Beach. Very lucky to live uh, near some of the greatest beaches in the country, I think. And, uh, you know, they uh, cost a lot, kids, as you know. And I'm sure you have reasons also why it's difficult sometimes to spend less than you earn. But it's absolutely essential that we learn to do so. Not easy, I have to say. Um, this is the Micorba principle, M-I-C-A-W-B-E-R, Micawber, named after Mr. Micawber from Charles Dickens' David Copperfield, who uh, is famous for this quotation, right? Okay, he said, annual income, 20 pounds, annual expenditure, 19 pounds, 19 and six, result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds, annual expenditure, 20 pounds, ought and six, result, misery. So that's Dickensian language for Spend less than you earn, or else you'll be miserable. Now, uh, Micorba was in debtor's prison, which is, you know, all very Victorian. Nothing quite that serious probably happens now. But the principle remains the same. Um, spending less than you earn, while it's easier to say than it is to do, is so essential because it enables you, firstly, to either get or stay out of debt. Um, not all debt is bad. Um, some debt can be very useful, but... If you don't want to be in debt, if you don't need to be in debt, the way to avoid it is to spend less than you earn. Now, if you are in debt, given that we're talking about basics here, if you are in debt, then there's a couple of videos on Meaningful Money. Just search for debt and you'll find them. Um, it'll tell you how to identify which um, uh, credit cards to get rid of first, you know, personal loans or store cards or whatever, which ones to hit first to become debt free as quickly as possible. And actually, while I'm there, while I'm talking about that, here's a book recommendation. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Uh, if I just move my fingers. This is The Automatic Millionaire, nasty American title, but by a fantastic guy called David Bach. Now, this is such an easy book. Look how big the print is. Huge. Uh, it's such an easy book to read. It'll take the average person 90 minutes at the most to read. But this is the simplest um, sort of well, the clues in the title, really. The best way of putting your finances on autopilot that I've ever come across. So highly re recommended, The Automatic Millionaire by David Back. And he also gives tips as to how to get out of debt quick in there. So good stuff. Um, but search meaningfulmoney.tv for debt, and then you'll find a couple of videos on that as well. Okay. Uh, how are we doing there, uh, viewers? Are we getting, um, is it working out for you? Or is it too uh, jittery or what? Perhaps you can send me a message on uh, on the chat there, and uh, we'll see what we can do. This is very much trial and error, so if there's anything I can do to make things better for tomorrow, I need to know. Okay, so spend less than you earn. The third of our um, sort of golden rules for financial planning. Good, things are working out. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Uh, things are working out. Okay. <laughs> So nice to get encouragement on the chat. Um, the third, we've had uh, begin with the end in mind and spend less than you earn. But um, the thirdly is to harness the power of compound interest. So these are three very different basic truths. But the power of compounding interest, if you use that, then your financial plans should go swimmingly. It's such a powerful tool. It's the oldest of all investment tools, and uh, you need to learn how to harness it. Now, compounding, if you remember from uh, school maths, I can't believe how much my nose is itching. It just is driving me mad. It's like April and hay fever all over again. Um, so, 
compounding, if you remember from school maths, is the sort of adding of interest onto interest. So simple figures. If you have £100 and it's invested at a 10% return, man alive, the time is going fast. Just seeing the clock. If you've got £100 and it's invested at 10%, then at the end of year one, you'll have £110 in your pot. But if the interest rate remains at 10% and you invest it for a further year, you're now getting 10% on the original capital plus the first year's interest. So at the end of that second year, you won't have 120 pounds, you'll have 121. Now, a couple of things about compounding. Firstly, time matters. So the longer you can give compounding time to work, the better it will serve you. So for instance, at, um, compounding at 5%, if you put some money away for 30 years um, and for 40 years, Compounding works so well that after 40 years, you would have twice the amount as you would have after 30 years. So that last 10 years, or strictly speaking, the first 10 years is when all the good work is done. So if you can put money away for 40 years, you will have twice the amount as you would if you put it away for 30 years. Incredibly important. So the longer you can give compounding time to work, the better. And the second thing to say about compounding is um, the principle of total return. Uh, you can talk about capital and income. So let's say you invest in shares, okay? We'll come back to how that might work a little bit later. Um, and shares produce dividends, which is just a form of income. Now, if you uh, take that income out and spend it, then all you've got in there is your capital. And the capital value will depend on the share price, and it'll go up and down and up and down, down a bit today. But if you uh, roll that income back in and buy more shares, then that's a way of forcing the issue with compounding. And, uh, significantly increasing uh, the benefits you get. So for example, if you'd invested £10,000 in the FTSE All Share uh, from the time that it started in 1986, so the FTSE All Share is just an index of companies in the UK. So if you'd have invested in that since 1986 to uh, when I did these figures, if you'd have taken the income out and spent it, your capital 10000 would be worth £31,927. But if you'd have rolled the income back in, your 10,000 would have become 93,694. Three times the amount by rolling in the income, buying more shares each time. So you can sort of give compounding a shot of adrenaline by reinvesting income. And that's the principle of total return. Right, so begin with the end in mind. Have a plan to work to, otherwise you'll never know where you're going and you'll certainly never get there. Spend less than you earn, just the most important of all the financial planning principles. And thirdly, harness the power of compound interest. Okay, those three things, if you get them right, will serve you pretty well. I'm amazed, I suppose it's because of the, uh, the intro at the beginning, that I've uh, just prattled on for 23 minutes instead of the proposed 12 or 13 or so. But still, we've got time for questions. And you'll be unsurprised to know that I've prepared some in advance. But I'm just going to hang on uh, a couple of seconds just to see if there is um, any questions on the chat or on Twitter. So I shall just refresh my uh, iPad screen here and just see if there's anything going on. Okay, lots of uh, messages of good luck. Thank you very much. Yeah, better than loose women, Richard. I appreciate that, I think. <laughs> It's good to know there's so many friends watching. Thank you very much for your support, guys. Okay, so if any questions crop up, then uh, do fire them at me. But um, I think, uh, let me first start with this one. Do you need an advisor or not? Okay, do you need an advisor or not? Now, I am an advisor, so obviously I'm uh, you know, going to err towards the side that, yes, you should have a financial advisor. Not everybody needs one, but I believe that everybody can benefit from one. Okay, so uh, you need to sort of look at your circumstances. One of the sort of um, reasons I set up Meaningful Money TV in the first place is because uh, there is a bunch of legislation happening uh, and coming into force at the end of next year called the Retail Distribution Review. Now, that is overall a very, very good thing. It is going to increase the level of qualification for financial advisors in this country. Um, it is going to abolish commission, which is at the root of uh, almost all financial mis-selling scandals of the past. And so it's overall a good thing, but it will certainly mean there will be less financial advisors around. Now, given what I said earlier about as a nation, we are under-educated and underserved, that would suggest that we're going to increasingly be thrown at the mercy of the banks for financial 
financial advice, not something I'm very happy about. So I set up Meaningful Money to just get good information out there so that if necessary, people could help themselves get the information and uh, go and arrange uh, whatever policy or thing they needed online, which you know, you, we can all do easily these days. So ask yourself the question, you know, do you need an advisor? Um, are you prepared to pay for one? Like any good service, it's, it must and should be paid for. Don't ever speak to an advisor who tells you his or her services are for free, because it's not true. Um, and just see whether your needs are you know, complex enough. So check out Meaningful Money. Um, uh, there are other places online as well where you can get good information and just see. You know, can you sort yourself out um, or would you benefit from seeing an advisor? But if you do, then be prepared to pay for it. Okay, and perhaps it might just be worth um, uh, answering the question whether there's a difference between a financial advisor or a financial planner. Okay, given this is financial planning week. Now, if somebody asked me at a dinner party or, you know, at the school gates or whatever, what I do for a living, I always say I'm a financial planner, which nobody has a clue really what that is or few people know what that is in this country. Internationally, in the US and Australia and other places, the certified financial planner designation is the gold standard. Um, but in this country, we generally don't know what a financial planner is. But I tend not to tell people I'm a financial advisor in case they back away in fear because they're concerned that I'm going to sell them an endowment or something. Now, the difference, for my mind, to, to be honest, the two, for, the two words are largely interchangeable. But for me, the difference is financial planning is this process of working with clients where the products that we sell are the last thing we get to. And the skill and the cost and the work is all in the process of um, getting to know you, working with you, helping you visualize and vocalize your long-term goals. Then looking at your current financial circumstances, seeing where you are now, and seeing what the gap is between where you are now and where you need to be, and then helping you determine ways where you can manageably get from A to B. Um, and then keep doing that. It's an ongoing relationship. Financial advisors, to me, still that, that name is, you know, I'd like to flog you an ISA, Mr. Client. Um, I have a relatively small number of clients. I have about 90 clients. I see them very regularly. They are good friends, often have lunch with them, which may be something to do with the size of my stomach. Um, but it's relationship, and that's why I love this job so much, and I have the easiest job in the world, I think, because the financial stuff, as we'll get to throughout the rest of the week, is really dead easy. I reckon it's probably 0 0.01 of the population that needs complex financial planning tools. For most of us, financial planning comes down to spend less than you earn, put the uh, difference away, and invest it wisely, and keep it under review. Those four things uh, will do for most people. One last uh, little word, now, given that the only question that's coming so far is what's for lunch, which is a ridiculous question, Steve, ridiculous, um, is uh, what happens if debt is a serious issue for you? Well, <clears throat> you can't really set your mind to financial planning if you're drowning in debt. So it depends how serious the issue is here. If you have very bad debt, you know, the sort of debt which is means you've got people calling you for payment or banging on your door or wanting to take away your TV or whatever, then you need to get help. That's not something a financial planner usually will be able to help you with. You need to get help from the professionals, so you need certainly to go to your Citizens Advice Bureau or get in touch with a fantastic organization called Christians Against Poverty. Now, don't be swayed by the religious name of that outfit. They are an incredibly well-respected debt counselor counseling agency um, and they will help you put together a plan for getting out to debt uh, out of debt working with your creditors and things like that so if the debt is bad then go see uh, Christians Against po Poverty it's just capuk.org um, or go to Citizens Advice Bureau but if it's just sort of ordinary debt but you want to get rid of it then again search meaningful money for the word debt and it'll throw up a couple of videos read the automatic millionaire which has got a fantastic way of uh, getting out of debt in there um, and you'll be good to go. So folks, incredibly, it's uh, approaching one o'clock, which means the first of these half hour live shows is done, which I think is fairly terrifying. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.